Well, welcome, folks, to this edition of the 700 Club. Well, the Democrats had at it. These are the second stringers last night. The, the front runners are going at it again tonight. It's an impossible thing to break through in that mob, but anyhow, they're trying. And the president uh, was very restrained, although he just said it was boring. And that was that came out of Japan. But uh, 10 more candidates take the stage tonight. And Amber Strong has the first look at that uh, first debate. Here she is. 10 candidates took to the stage for 2020's first round. Up until now, they've worked hard to stay above the fray. But last night, the gloves were off. There are a lot of politicians who say, oh, it's just not possible. What they're really telling you is they just won't fight for it. NBC News moderators hitting on the top issues like health care. But it was division over Medicare for all that gave viewers the first spark of the evening. It's not working. <laughs> that's How right. So, so for those for whom it's not working. working, they can choose Medicare. For the coronary workers in you the you got to start by acknowledging the system is for not working plans. for people. I think we should be the party that keeps what's working and fixes what's broken. It took nearly 15 minutes before any mention of the name Donald Trump, but the administration's current policies took center stage. On Iran, this president and his chicken hawk cabinet have led us to the brink of war with Iran. I served in the war in Iraq at the height of the war in 2005. The American people need to understand that this war with Iran would be far more devastating. The candidates also taking shots at each other on immigration and recent calls to decriminalize illegal border crossing. The reason that they're separating these little children from their families is that they're using Section 1325 of that act, which criminalizes coming across the border, to incarcerate the, the parents and then separate them. Some of us on this stage have called to end that section, to terminate it. Some, like Congressman O'Rourke, have not. You're looking at just one small part of this. I'm talking about a comprehensive rewrite of our immigration That's laws. If you did your homework on this issue, you would know. When it comes to abortion and keeping Roe v. Wade in place, uh, presidential contenders abortion. standing firm. I would make certain that every woman has access to the full range of reproductive health care services, and that includes birth control, it includes abortion, it includes everything for a woman. I would appoint judges to the federal bench that understand the precedent of Roe v. Wade and will respect it. Lesser known candidates such as Ohio Representative Tim Ryan were working hard to appeal to moderates. We could talk about climate, we could talk about guns, we could talk about all of these issues that we all care about. We have a perception problem with the Democratic Party. We are not connecting to the working class people. If you want to beat Mitch McConnell, this better be a working class party. The only biblical reference of the night came from Senator Cory Booker and his rebuke on gun violence. I'm and I'm tired of hearing people, all they have to offer is thoughts and prayers. In my faith, people say faith without works is dead. The surprise winners, at least according to the polls and Google search trends, Tulsi Gabbard and Julian Castro. Now it's time to break out another scorecard as the remaining 10 candidates, including Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders, take to the stage tonight. Amber Strong, CBN News, Washington. Well, CBN Chief Political Analyst David Brody is joining us now. David, what's your scorecard? What do you, who was it? Did anybody win last night? Well, I think Julian Castro won. Uh, and when I say won, I'm not necessarily saying won the debate on, on points or anything like that, but he stepped up and he got into the uh, media narrative and there'll be a lot more ink written about him going forward. And that's a victory, Pat. Uh, Elizabeth Warren obviously did well uh, because it was, you know, basically uh, her stage. She got the first question. She got the last closing statement uh, and she had the policy chops. You might not agree with the policy chops. So a lot of folks don't. Uh, but she was able to defend it well and articulate it well and use the word America quite often. So, so that's going to play well from a populist standpoint. But I thought Julian Castro definitely uh, stepped up his game. Look, I think ultimately, Pat, here what this is about is who are going to be the top four uh, Democrats when this is all over. You got Biden. Sanders, most likely Elizabeth Warren as well. That's three. So who is in that fourth slot? And I think Castro had to take on Beto O'Rourke last night, kind of like a like a Democrat Hunger Games, if you will, to kind of get into that fourth slot, along with potentially Kamala Harris and Pete Buttigieg, who we will see on Thursday night. Well, Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders are the big names tonight. Have you got any mm -hmm. uh, expectation out of that? 
Well, I think Joe Biden is going to be Joe Biden. And some people will say that's great. Other people will say, oi, gavolt. Uh, but look, the bottom line is, is that Joe Biden has a little bit of Donald Trump in him. Uh, and we saw that play out with this whole thing with Cory Booker and the fact that uh, Cory Booker wanted an apology because Joe Biden was working with well-known segregationists back in the 70s on public policy, not related to segregation. Uh, and basically, Cory Booker wanted that apology. And Joe Biden said, I'm not going to give you an apology. As a matter of fact, you need to apologize to me. So, you know, there is a bit of Donald Trump, if you will, in that the chutzpah factor uh, when it comes to Biden. I think we'll see that on stage tonight if he gets attacked. The question is, how much will he get attacked? I think Bernie Sanders is going to go after him a little bit. Uh, Kamala Harris might as well on the race issue. We'll have to wait and see. Well, Biden, again, looks like he's so far ahead, but he is uh, subject to gaffes when he... Uh, gets pressed that he can say some really stupid things. Well, the only person I think at this point that can beat Joe Biden is Joe Biden. Uh, I also think the only person that could potentially beat Donald Trump is Donald Trump. I mean, I think they both have kind of a similar uh, issue, if you will. Uh, but Biden, for sure, has been gaff prone. That has kind of been his uh, bread and butter, unfortunately, in a negative way uh, over the years. But one thing to remember, uh, Pat, about Joe Biden, uh, look, all of the oxygen and all of the attention and all of the media fanfare is with AOC and Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar and the far left and the Green New Deal. And we hear about it. Uh, to the point where we need to take Alka-Seltzer. But the truth of the matter is mainstream Democrats in this country are a lot more in line with Joe Biden than they are with the AOCs of the world and the Bernie Sanders of the world. So uh, sometimes we see a little smoke and mirrors here. There's a magic show going on. And that's why I think Biden's numbers will stay relatively consistent unless he makes some sort of big gaffe. And that, of course, is always the danger. You know, it's really going to be tough trying to think you're the party of the future when you've got an old guy actually older than Trump. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know how many of these millennials are going to go for somebody like that in the general election. What do you think? Well, right. I, I think you're right. You know, it's funny when if Biden's the candidate or Bernie Sanders is the candidate, I don't see Bernie necessarily being the candidate. But if Biden is the candidate, I mean, Donald Trump is the young one in the bunch. I mean, what does that say about the Democrats? But more than that, uh, look, climate change, uh, we hear so much about. Well, that's big with millennials and with the Gen uh, Z crowd. I hope I got my alphabet correct. It's Gen Z, right? Yeah, it's Gen Z. So, look, all of that is kind of trending on Twitter, but Joe Biden's not necessarily trending with all of that. Yes, he believes in climate change and that, but it's not necessarily something that's fully motivating him. He's a lot more in that mainstream Democrat thought. And the question Democrats are going to have to wrestle with is, are they going to be okay with a Joe Biden ultimately uh, because they just want to beat Trump? I, I believe that's the way it's going, but there's a long time right now. All right, well, Trump's getting ready to go to a, a G20 uh, meeting. Mm -hmm. well, what do you think he's going to ask uh, Xi of, of China? He's got some talking points. What do you think he's going to emphasize? Well, you know, look, I mean, Donald Trump, the, the president, the White House, this administration believes they are in a strong position. Uh, they believe the tariffs are working. Uh, now, whether or not there's some obvious downside to that, I mean, ask some farmers around the country and uh, potentially uh, the, the stock market being kind of rough and tumble for a while. But they believe this ultimately will work. I'm not quite sure if there's really a deal uh, to be had at this point from a political standpoint. I mean, uh, President Xi in China is, very, is under a lot of political pressure not to give in to Donald Trump. Uh, at the same time, this kind of works politically for Donald Trump as well. Uh, so, so we'll see. I mean, I know that President Xi is looking at somehow getting some concessions from this administration. I know they want uh, that big telecom firm uh, to basically, uh, the one that China owns, is that apparently cozy with the Chinese government. Uh, they want that telecom firm to basically stop being banned by U.S. companies. So I, I don't see that necessarily being part of a deal. I don't think we're going to see anything right now coming out of the G20. Uh, has he uh, telegraphed any of the talking points for his uh, upcoming campaign, you think? Well, I think there are a couple things going on. First of all, we saw at Faith and Freedom, uh, the Faith and Freedom event, that's Ralph Reed's group, the Road to Majority Conference. Uh, he talked a lot about abortion uh, to this group because, obviously, the Democrats have embraced late-term abortion. They've embraced the Born Alive Infant Protection Act. Look, no restrictions. And, matter of fact, he addressed that at Faith and Freedom. I want to play a short little clip, Pat, if we can. Unfortunately, Democrat politicians have become increasingly hostile 
to pro-life Americans who want to help more children find a loving home and share their dreams with the world. Virtually every top Democrat lawmaker now supports taxpayer-funded abortion right up to the moment of birth. We're definitely seeing a lot of that uh, abortion talk from President Trump, and Pat, that'll be part of the strategy, along with socialism and the radical left. They've gone off the deep end, according to this president. You know, I was talking to Ralph Freed, uh, who, of course, as we said, talked about, uh, is the CEO of the Faith and Freedom uh, Coalition, who put on that event. I was talking to him yesterday. He believes that, remember, evangelicals, white conservative evangelicals made up 81 percent. 81 percent voted for Donald Trump right. uh, in the election. Ralph Reed believes that number could actually end up being 84 percent, possibly 85 percent in 2020. Now, if that's the case, uh, Pat, uh, he'll re win re-election. There's not even a doubt about that. He's going to have to be north of 81 percent, though. Well, there hasn't been any uh, president in my lifetime that's given the evangelicals what uh, Trump has. And uh, it's like the labor unions used to be for the Democrats. The uh, evangelicals mm -hmm. are a solid block that he can... He can almost, if you use the term take to the bank, they're there for him. And so I think he plays to his base, but he does have to pick up some more around the edges to get a, a, a working majority. Well, David Brody, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. And we look forward to more of your incisive comments. God bless you. Thanks, Wendy, Pat. Appreciate it. Sex trafficking, 800 million bucks. Amazing. In San Diego, beautiful San Diego, it's happening. Yeah, it really, I mean, it's a gorgeous place. I, I left there uh, on the way to Korea, I remember distinctly, boarding a troop ship in San Diego. Wow. <laughs>